Welcome to the 2023 Corcoran Chair Conference sponsored by the Center for Christian Jewish Learning at Boston College. I am Dr. Dan Jocelyn Smetowski, the Kraft Family Professor of Jewish Christian Relations and the Director of the Center for Christian Jewish uh, Learning. It's been a real pleasure to work with Dr. Franz von Lira over this academic year to plan our conference on the theme of shared scripture, divided faiths, the medieval Jewish Christian encounter over the Hebrew Bible slash Old Testament. Now I first met Franz well over 20 years ago at Kalamazoo, the International Medieval Congress. And from the beginning, Franz's passion for the subjects of the medieval Jewish Christian encounter over scriptures was evidence. He has built a distinguished career working on creating critical editions of landmark texts in this field and developing scholarly analysis of the exchange between Jews and Christians over biblical exegesis. And this, Franz, has also modeled the best of what the encounter over scripture can be, a pathway for mutual understanding and perhaps even some works of repair and reconciliation. Of course, the story of this encounter in the medieval era is complex. If much of the work of the history of Jewish Christian relations has been informed by Salo Baron's critique of a lachrymose conception of Jewish history, there's still a need for a clear-eyed assessment of this period. While scholars have been able at times to paint a positive picture of medieval Jews and Christians consulting each other over points of biblical interpretation, that history has not been uniformly positive. Sometimes the shared encounter over scripture was hostile, or certainly at least not a conversation of true equals. Frequently, there was a high degree of ambivalence and ambiguity in this encounter. And so judgment is necessary to make sense of these exchanges to which we only have texts that hint at complex social realities. The work of this conference over these next two days invites us to sit with the range of possible encounters between medieval Christians and Jews over scripture that were at once shared and also a point of division. It's my hope that we can carefully and collectively do the work of listening both to the past and to one another amidst the positive, the negative, and the ambivalent that might surface. I'm very grateful to all of our presenters or respondents who have taken time to engage in this work. Likewise, I offer welcome to our in-person audience and to the well over 100 people who have registered online for this event. I also want to take a moment to welcome Dr. Jonathan Dechter of Brandeis University. Jonathan, where are you? There you are, Jonathan. Jonathan is our, uh, will be our Corcoran Visiting Chair next year, and it's a real pleasure to have him here as he gets to know the work of the center and the work of this conference. Also to Dr. Camille Markey, the Associate Director of the Center for Christian Jewish Learning, I am especially grateful for her careful preparation for this conference. I'm sure all of you are as well. So now I'm happy to turn our proceedings over to my colleague, Dr. David Hunter, the Flatley Professor of Catholic Theology at Boston College for our first session. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. It's my pleasure to introduce the speakers in our first session this afternoon. Uh, our first speaker will be Dr. Devorah Schoenfeld, uh, Dr. Schoenfeld is Associate Professor of Theology at Loyola University in Chicago, where she teaches Judaism, Bible, and Jewish-Christian relations. She is the author of a book titled Isaac on Jewish and Christian Altars, Polemic and Exegesis in Rashi and the Glossa Ordinaria from Fordham University Press. She received her PhD from the Graduate Theological Union in 2007 and her rabbinic ordination from Yeshivat Maharat 
in 2019. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Schoenfeld. The Song of Songs is read almost universally by medieval exegetes as about the love between God and God's people. But how many love stories is it? Is it one love story or many? The Song of Songs is unified by its theme, language, and structure, not by its plot or setting. On the one hand, it is easy to see the repetitions of language. On the other, the basic markers of a romance plot are missing. As Natalia Brenner points out, there seems to be no change to the state of the characters from beginning to end. Both the first and last song are in the voice of a woman desiring an absent lover. The male protagonist is sometimes King Solomon and sometimes a shepherd. The female protagonist is sometimes wealthy and urban, sometimes a village dwelling vineyard keeper, sometimes marrying a king, and sometimes getting assaulted by random police. This left medieval exegetes, like modern ones, with two choices. One is to interpret each unit of the Song of Songs separately. Midrash Rabbah takes this approach, making very little attempt to connect passages in the Song of Songs to each other, but rather to other locations in the Bible. The other choice, and the one taken by most exegetes, is to find or to construct some kind of unity or of plot, characters, and settings. The exegetes that make this choice still need to account for the multiplicity somehow and to find some way of dealing with the contradictions. This paper is part of a larger project in which I look at some of the history of how medieval exegetes, both Jewish and Christian, deal with the question of unity and multiplicity of characters, narr narratives, and settings in, the ri in writing their Song of Songs commentaries. This larger pro project begins with the Targum and with Origen, both of which set the framework for reading the Song of Songs as a unified text in Jewish and Christian exegetical traditions. For the Targum, the multiplicity of metaphors reflects the changing relationship that the Jewish people has with God in different time periods. For Origen, the Song of Songs is a play with different voices. In this particular piece, I will look at two medieval exegetes, Rashi and Bede, and how their reading of the Song of Songs as unified reflects their reading of history as unified. The Song of Songs in the, is a single text in the same way that the Bible is a single text, in the, and in the same way the Bible and contemporary history are both part of the same text. Creating unity from the gaps and the breaks in the Song of Songs also allows for unity between the past and the present. The medieval Jewish approach to reading the Song of Songs as a single love story begins with the 12th century Rashi, with the 12th century French Jewish exegete, Rabbi Solomon ben Isaac, known by his acronym as Rashi. In his, commentary, in, in his introduction to his commentary on the Song of Songs, which I gave you an excerpt from, source number one. Um, he states that his goal is to work with pre-existing midrashic materials and to weave them together into a coherent story. As he writes, I have seen for this book many agotic interpretations. There are those who explain all this book in one midrash, and there are those scattered among various midrashim, and those who interpret individual texts and those and do not fit the language of the text and the order of the text. And I said that my heart to seize the meaning of the text and to set the explanations in order and to make each midrash of the sages fit in their proper place. Although he states that his commentary here draws on various midrashim and he draws extensively in his commentary on midrash rabbah, he sets the different interpretations into an order which largely follows the targum. The targum, an interpretive translation of the Song of Songs into Aramaic, interprets the, so the Song of Songs as entirely about the relationship between God and Israel. 
it retells the Song of Songs as about the history of the Jewish people from Revelation to the present day. So he takes the Midrash and fits it to the order of the text following the Targum. But at the same time, he tells a different story. This book is based by the Holy Spirit uh, in the metaphor of a woman bound in living widowhood. This is a reference to, to Samuel. Uh, longing for a husband, leaning on her beloved, remembering the love of her youth for him and admitting her sins. Her beloved is also suffering with him in her pain. That's a reference to Isaiah. Remembers the love of her youth and the beauty of her beauty, the rightness of her deeds. That with him he was connected with her in a powerful love. That she might know that he is not ca causing her suffering from his heart. That's a reference to Lamentations. Her exile is not exile, Isaiah. For she is wife and he is her husband. Ref reference to a very troubling passage in Hosea. And he will return to her. All right. Rashi here constructs a love story based on his reading of the Song of Songs as a single story of a middle-aged estranged couple. He deals with the inconsistencies in the stories and their differences in relationship status by placing the story in a first-person sub subjective narrative of a woman and by having her story move backwards and forwards in time. This is mapped onto an allegorical reading which is about the history of Israel and based on the Targum, but read out of order, starting from the present day and going back in time to Revelation. So it's based on the Targum, but it's unlike the Targum, which proceeds linearly. In this way, passages in which the, the couple seem to be estranged, such as 1-7, where the man and the woman are not together, and the woman needs to ask the man where she can find him, can be explained as describing the present reality of exile, where the husband and wife are living separately. Later, in 116.17, where they are described as living in a home together, that is, a, that is the wife looking back longingly to the past, or allegorically, that describes Israel in the newly built temple. Rashi devotes particular attention to chapter 5, verses 2 to 7. He describes it in his comment on 5.3 as, quote, a wife grieving the husband of her youth and searching for him. He imagines as her living separately from her husband because she is committing adultery and they have separated. But when he knocks on her door, she can't help but be moved to seek after him. This is a turning point in their relationship. And although it does not immediately lead to their reunion, it makes her want to be with him and to tell other women about him and about their past in the hope of finding him. What drives Rashi's decision to tell the story of Song of Songs in a non-chronological way? Baruch Alster suggests that Rashi was led by the meandering structure of the text, Song of Songs, and the difficulties of finding a plot in it, the way the lovers are longing for each other, both at the beginning and at the end of the book. Some modern commentators are led similarly. Ilana Pardes, for example, reads the Song of Songs as a dream about love from the woman's perspective in which the frequent shifts in character and setting operate according to dreamlike logic. Sarah Kameen, conversely, re reads Rashi's motivations in his non-chronological love story as polemical and in conversation with Christian rhetoric about God's rejection of Israel. The non-linear structure of Rashi's retelling of Song of Songs is a way of recognizing the current difficult times that Jews are experiencing in medieval France, but situating them as only one moment in a long love story as retold by an old married woman who is extremely confident that the man she married still loves her. I would like to suggest that some of Rashi's quotes suggest a third motivation as well, that of finding unity in difficult texts in the Bible. The biblical references that Rashi selects in retelling the story in his, in his introduction add the troubling implication that the husband mistreated the wife. The reference to living widowhood is from 2 Samuel 20 and describes King David abandoning his concubines after Absalom forced them to lie with him. In Rashi's comment on Exodus 22:23, he describes living widowhood as worse than actual widowhood. The reference to Lamentations 3 draws the reader's attention to the parallels between Lamentations and Song of Songs. 
Like the Song of Songs, the Book of Lamentations is also spoken in multiple voices. The Book of Lamentations is also a collection of poems without a clear narrative thread. Four of the five chapters are spoken in the third person and describe the suffering of the daughter of Jerusalem, which stands in for both the city and its people. The Song of Songs describes different kinds of relationship between lovers. Lamentations describe different kinds of relationship between suffering people and God. The choice to pair Song of Songs with Lamentations put these two multivocal texts in conversation. Rashi makes a similar point on Lamentations 1-1. Has become like a widow, Rashi explains, but not really a widow, rather like a widow whose husband went abroad and he intends to return to her. So Rashi begins his commentaries on Song of Songs and Lamentations by turning them both into the same story, that of a woman who is abandoned by her husband, is missing him, and is telling stories about him in the hope that he will return. The references to Isaiah help bring Song of Songs and Lamentations together. The passages from Isaiah and Hosea are some of the passages that John Levinson notes that outline the biblical logic of analogy between marriage and human divine relationship. Isaiah 50 and 63 are both part of passages that speak of return after exile and which draw in marriage imagery to describe what this return from exile will look like. As a youth espouses a maiden, so your sons will espouse you. And as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. But it is the references to Hosea at the beginning and end of the passage that provide the clearest thematic bridge between song and so of songs and lamentations. The beginning of Hosea 2 describes God, or Hosea, committing sexualized violence against Israel or against Hosea's wife, Gomer. Else I will strip her, na her naked and leave her as on the day she was born. I will make her like a wilderness, render her like a desert. This has some similarities to the description of the sexualized public humiliation of the daughter of Jerusalem in Lamentations. All who pass your way clap their hands at you. They hiss and wag, wag their head at fair Jerusalem. Is this the city that was called perfect in beauty, joy of the earth? They hiss and gnash their teeth and cry, we've ruined her. Hosea chapter 2 ends with a dramatic turn into union between human and divine, which is compared to a marriage. The imagery at, towards the end of chapter 2 includes agriculture and nature imagery, a covenant with the beasts of the field and the birds of the air and the creeping things of the ground, and a promise that the earth will, be, will respond with new grain and wine and oil. The marriage here is also to be more egalitarian, promising that Israel will call God by a word for a husband that does not connote master, Baal, because that word is also a name for the false gods that will be abolished. The difference between the end of beginning and end of Hosea 2 is so striking that some contemporary scholars have gone so far as to consider them to have been written by different authors. But the difference between the beginning and end of chapter 2 is also the difference between lamentations and song of songs, between violence and nature imagery, between terror and egalitarianism. Hosea provides a narrative key to how to read lamentations and song of songs as a single story. Rabbinic exegesis of Hosea which Rashi cites in his commentary, as la adds layers to the story. Pesachim 87a portrays, portrays Hosea as, quote, an elder who does not know how to defend Israel. His marriage to Gomer is intended to teach him that no matter what the texts say, in reality is not actually correct to, to divorce an ad adulterous wife, and therefore God should not reject Israel. Numbers Rabbah 215 goes further by mocking God for succumbing to what appears to be male jealousy in Hosea. It parallels the story of Hosea to the story of the golden calf and imagines Moses saying to God, this calf can help you. It can send the rain while you send the dew. When God retorts that this calf is a statue and can't do anything, Moses asks, God, why then are you so angry at it? Hosea, for Rashi, 
provides a few important narrative elements. It adds the adultery of the wife and the subsequent abandonment of the husband, which then leads into explaining Song of Songs 5, 2 to 7 as the woman's decision to return to the man after living separately from him. This helps explain why it's a different, difficult decision for her to get up and open the door for him, and what, why, once she finally does, it's difficult for her to find him. The physical abuse that she endures from the guardian of the walls is also an echo of the violence that she endures when she tries to return in Hosea. The rabbinic interpretations add that the man is also not innocent in his decision to abandon her and to leave her as a living widow. Rashi's story takes these elements from Hosea and constructs another story around them. Unlike Hosea's story, which starts at the beginning of a relationship, Rashi's story of love, of grief, of love and grief in Song of Songs and Lamentations starts in the beginning between a couple that already has a long history together. While Hosea is told from the perspective of a male narrator, which allows the rabbis to introduce the possibility that he may be unreliable, the story behind Song of Songs and Lamentations is, in Rashi's retelling, spoken by a grieving woman. Changing the perspective of the story changes its meaning. If for the Targum, the Song of Songs is about God's ongoing love for Israel, for Rashi, the Song of Songs is about Israel's enduring love for God. Reading the Bible as a narrative whole requires facing the challenge that the God of Exodus and the God of Lamentations is the same God. The God of Song of Songs is the same God of Hosea, is the same God of Lamentations. I'd like to contrast this briefly with even Ezra's simpler, sweeter story. The main protagonist of even Ezra's story is a woman who works in the vineyard who falls in love with a shepherd. That's source number two. Um, the story follows her pursuits of him. The deviations from the straightforward narrative function as comparisons to it. When the text mentions a king or King Solomon, it is because the, both the man and the woman are compared to the king over the course of the story. The man is more beautiful and the woman is braver. In his comment on chapter one, verse four, even Ezra has all the woman's friends say that even if the king were to bring him into, their, into the king's chambers, actually, they would prefer this shepherd. Um, in his comment on chapter 3, verse 10, um, Ibn Ezra explains about King Solomon's couch in um, chapter 3, verses 7 to 10 by connecting them to the woman going out to seek her beloved in 3, 1 to 2. Um, when she wakes, she goes out to seek him, and he is surprised and say, says, who is this who comes up from the desert like pillars of smoke, perfumed? He wonders how she can come out on her own since King Solomon needed many men to guard the one that he desired from kidnappers that might kidnap her. He is surprised at her courage in going out to find him when King Solomon sends so many soldiers to protect his bride and how much she is willing to risk when it seems like he has so much less to offer her. Throughout Ibn Ezra's story, the, um, the woman is active in pursuing him. In chapter 5, verse 2 to 7, which is the only time in Song of Songs where the woman is hesitant, this is a dream of hers. And when she wakes from this dream, she is even more resolute to continue on her pursuit. Unsurprisingly, Ibn Ezra's biblical references are quite different from Rashi's. He begins the story with Abraham and goes from there to Moses and proceeds linearly from there through biblical history. Most of the initiative in this relationship with God is Israel's, like the woman initiates in, in Ibn Ezra's reading of the love story. And in the end, it ends in the present moment with Israel impatient for redemption. Ibn Ezra also traces a through line in the Bible through Song of Songs to the present moment, but it's a different line about humans seeking God. For a Christian parallel to Rashi's construction of sacred history through the Bible, I'm looking to the 8th century commentary of Bede, um, one of um, two early Christian commentaries to follow the entire Song of Songs from beginning to end. Bede, like Rashi, reads the Song of Songs as nonlinear sacred history. 
In Bede's retelling, while the bride ultimately represents the faithful, throughout the song, she has various identities, the synagogue, the church, the individual soul. The story that Bede tells is about the work of the church to establish itself in the world. It begins with the recognition of Christ by believing Jews and progresses from there to the work that the church does in outreach and in seeking truth. The story of the church is told here largely in the abstract, not connected to particular historical biblical events, but still with twists and turns, sometimes fighting against heretics and schismatics, sometimes seeking the one its soul loves. A thread Bede returns to is the, identify, is the identification of the bride with both the church and the synagogue and the longing that they be, rec that they be reconciled. Source number three, Whoever desires to read the Song of Songs in which the wisest of kings, Solomon, describes the mysteries of Christ, that is the eternal king in a city, under the figure of the bridegroom and the bride, should remember, first of all, that the whole congregation of the elect is called the church, and yet now, for the sake of distinction, the, por the portion of the faithful which preceded the Lord's incarnation is particularly named the synagogue, and that which follows it, the church. Now, these two portions of the righteous are sharers in one and the same faith and the love of Christ, although they have two different sacraments. As the apostle Peter testifies when he says, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor the ancestors have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. In Bede's introduction, just like Rashi's, he sets out the identification of the bride. She moves backwards and forwards in time, and between these two identities, the church and the synagogue. In the introduction, he describes it as harmonious, two, por two portions of the righteous sharers of the same faith. But the biblical text that he quotes is about the decision of the Council of Jerusalem that Gentile followers of Jesus would not need to follow Jewish practices. So it's the, one of the decisions that created the separation of Christianity and Judaism into two religions. Constructing unity between Judaism and Christianity requires first identifying them as separate. The unity and separateness of the church and the synagogue creates, for Bede, yet another love story in the Song of Songs, and that is their love for each other. For Bede, the female protagonist of the song, is sometimes the church and sometimes the synagogue, and sometimes the church longs for the synagogue and expresses this longing. That's source number four. Return, return, O Shulamite, return, return, that we may look upon you. Return to the knowledge of your Redeemer, away from whom you have been straying miserably for so long, and be imbued with the sacrament so that you will be proved worthy to enter into heavenly life. Return to the peace of your sisterhood, which you have so long considered as something to be scorned Return in, pu in purity of faith so that we may contemplate the beauty of your chastity, which we have desired to see for so long. Shulamith, who is the bride, is here the present day synagogue, and the church takes the role of the chorus of women speaking to her. The longing here is fascinating. She wants to see the beauty of your chastity. Similarly, in Song 3-4, when the bride goes out in the middle of the night to find the groom, holds him, and never lets him go, Bede interprets this as the church insisting that it will never let go of its determination to bring the synagogue back. There are other passages like this as well. Bede constructs a unified narrative out of the histories of the church and the synagogue, but at the same time, they are separate enough to create a third love story that of the love of the church for the synagogue and its longing to build a home together with it. This is, in Bede's context, seemingly fictional. There aren't real live Jews in 8th century England that he is actively trying to convert. Uh, Andrew Scheel argues that Bede, as well as English, other English thinkers of his time, strongly identified the English people with the people of Israel and used the biblical story of Israel to tell the story of their people. I gave you in source five um, an example from Bede's history in which he compares the conquest of England by the Saxons 
to the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. To put it briefly, the, the fire kindled by the hands of the heathen executed the just vengeance of God on the nation for its crimes. It was not unlike the fire once kindled by the Chaldeans, which consumed the walls and all the buildings of Jerusalem. For Bede, the Song of Songs is about God's love for one people, which is composed of the church, the synagogue, and each individual soul. It is essential that it be all of these together because if the synagogue is left out, then the holy people of, no, of England have no mechanism for being part of a sacred history. For Bede, like Faraji, reading the Bible and therefore the Song of Songs as part of an integrated whole is a way of making sense of a current reality. But just like Rashi is writing in a situation of exile, Bede is writing in a situation of Jewish and Christian disunity. That is why it is good that the Song of Songs both begins and ends with longing. Reading longing into the breaks and cracks in the Bible legitimates hope and even expectation for a future that is different from the present. I'll end with a few words about how the unity that Bede creates is subverted when his comments are integrated into the Glossa Ordinaria. The structure of Bede's commentary, a line-by-line -line commentary written by a single author on the whole book from beginning to end, leads to consistency. The structure of the Glossa Ordinaria, conversely, leads, towards le leads the reader towards seeing multiplicity. Each commentary is broken up into pieces and juxtaposed with other commentaries that interpret the biblical text in contrasting ways. Commentaries are inserted in between the lines of the biblical text. A reader encountering the text is going to be drawn to dwell on each individual unit and its varying interpretations, rather than moving on from section to section and creating a narrative between them. To take an example, um, on chapter one, verse two, your name is oil poured out, Gloss quotes a range of interpretations. Bede says this means your name is like oil which refreshes the soul. Anselm says your name is like oil which makes me want to kiss you. Origen says the name of Christ causes not only his name, the name of Christ, but also the name of Moses to be heard through the world. And there's no real attempt made by the Gloss to reconcile these with each other. When we get later to the Shulamit imagery, so Shulamit is the synagogue, Bede's longing for union with the synagogue gets intertwined with very harsh language about the Jews that is less about longing, that is much more, much more harshly negative, that describes Jews in even demonic terms, and that's a very different version of sacred history. So while the movement from Midrash Rabbah to Rashi takes separate pieces of exegesis and weaves them into a consistent story, the Glossa Ordinaria takes what is a consistent story in Bede and breaks it down into a series of separate, isolated comments. Either way is going to work because ultimately the choice to read Song of Songs as a single narrative or as a collection of separate pieces is a choice that exegetes can make. But the different readings are going to have different theological stakes. Do we read sacred history as proceeding through one narrative or through many? How many love stories is God involved in? How many lovers really are there in a theological reading of the Song of Songs? Thank you. Thank you very much, Deborah. And I apologize for not reading the title of your paper when I introduced you. I Hope I don't forget for the other speakers. Do you want to set up the, the Zoom link first? Oh, okay. Our next speaker who will be joining us uh, remotely is Dr. Judith Oshoi Schlanger. Uh, Dr. Oshoi Schlanger is fellow and professor in Hebrew and Jewish studies at Corpus Christi. Corpus Christi College, uh, Oxford University, and professor of Hebrew manuscript studies at the Ecole Pratique des Hautes Etudes in Paris. She graduated in Hebrew and Oriental languages 
des instituts nationaux des langues et civilisations orientales in Paris and obtained her PhD in Cambridge, St. John's College. Her research activities include diplomatic study of legal documents in Hebrew characters from different parts of the medieval Jewish world, Jewish book culture and its contacts with non-Jewish intellectual environments, and Hebrew paleography. Her publications include Hebrew and Hebrew Latin documents from medieval England, a diplomatic and paleographical study from Breppels, 2015, and another book, Books Within Books, New Discoveries in Old Book Bindings from Brill in 2014. The title of her paper this afternoon is New Perspectives for the Study of Bilingual Psalters from Medieval England. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Chloe Schlanker. Thank you for your introduction. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> can you hear me? I don't know whether I can start talking. Yes, okay, great. Thank you very much. It is a, an unusual experience. I teach a lot by Zoom, but now I just see myself talking with half a minute of a delay and I can't see you. So if something is wrong, please write or please shout so that I know that you can't follow or that uh, I am disconnected from you. I'm really sorry not to be with you in, in presence. Um, I'm in Toronto to give at, at another conference, so I, I'm simply happy that I can join you for this wonderful conference just for this very short time. So thank you for invitation. Um, I'm going to talk uh, today about just a tiny little part of my own work and of what I think it's one of the most exciting aspects of the Christian study of the Bible in the medieval period in the 12th and 13th century. I refer to the comparison of the Vulgate with the text of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, in medieval England, in particular... Is it okay? In medieval England in particular, this interest in the biblical text prompted the unprecedented study of the Hebrew language. Um, and also the production of the linguistic tools that we normally did not expect be before the 16th century and the Renaissance, such as dictionaries and grammars, and I was involved in the publication of these medieval uh, manuscripts. Mm, among other very important uh, works of the School of Medieval Hebraists in England was the creation of a new translation from Hebrew into Latin. This translation was written in Hebrew manuscripts above the lines of the Hebrew text. This is why it is usually called superscriptio. So now I'm going to share my screen with you. Yes. So I'd like to, to, first of all, to give you an example of what I'm going to talk about. I'm talking about manuscripts like this one, which is manuscript Corpus Christi College 10, which was written in England in the second quarter of the 13th century. It contains on the same page, three different versions of the Bible, or rather four different versions of the Bible. It contains the text of the Hebrew Psalter. So we have it here on the right followed by, the, by a column of the Latin Vulgate translation of St. Jerome, the Hebraica version, and then another Jerome's translation, the Gallicana version. Between the lines of the Hebrew text, you see the superscriptio, the new translation which was created in medieval England directly from Hebrew into Latin. Uh, so this superscriptio was uh, defined by um, Beryl Smalley, who was one of the... Um, pioneers of the study of the manuscripts with the superscriptio as the work of um, 
uh, of uh, uh, Robert Grostes. She based her definition of Henry of Cosey, the Franciscan, 14th century English Franciscan, who in his commentary on Psalms written in 1336, uh, described a psalter of the Lord of in Lincoln, and we know, of course, that Robert Grostes was the Bishop of Lincoln, in which are contained three or four synchronized psalters together, just like Corpus Christi College 10 that you have just seen. And then he adds that the church has not so far made authoritative the superscriptio, which the Lord of Lincoln made right in his Hebrew Psalter, word by word, like in Hebrew. He did it for the sake of understanding of our scriptures. <clears throat> I have myself worked on the manuscripts containing superscriptio, and I came to the conclusion that at least some of them are related to, uh, to the East Anglian Benedictine Monastery of uh, Ramsey. Um, identifying the origin of superscriptio either with Robert Grostest or with the old Ramsey Abbey, Benedictine Ramsey Abbey, is in fact not very contradictory. As we have seen, Cosé, the source of various smallest identification, does not talk about Lord of Lincoln as the author of the superscriptio, as, uh, rather as the one who made it right in the in the uh, in his in his psalter in his Hebrew psalter? So uh, it is likely that the origin, the authors of the superscript were different. And because Ramsey Abbey was in the diocese of uh, Lincoln, it's not. And we know that Grostest visited Ramsey several times. It is not excluded that actually people monks from Ramsey Abbey worked on the superscriptio. I'm not going to go further into this question. I have published a lot on the question of Ramsey and the origin of the bilingual manuscript, but maybe during the questions, I will be, I will be happy to, 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 to answer any queries that you might have. Today, I would like rather to share with you some results of my recent work in progress on the edition and analysis of the superscriptio. I will I will give you a, a, a few ideas, a, a brief background about the superscriptio, and then I would like to analyze just two examples of the superscriptio in several different manuscripts in order to, um, to speak about the relationship between the text of the superscriptio and the manuscripts themselves across the attested witnesses of the superscriptio. And also, I would like to, to suggest which one of the, of the manuscripts was the model for the copy of the others. In doing so, I'm trying to show that these manuscripts and the text of the superscriptio are related and that we are talking not a, um, here not about separate initiatives, but rather about a concerted production of books with a new Latin translation. So first of all, I would like to point out that there are two types of manuscripts. Some of them contain a full superscriptio, like the Psalter in, in, uh, in Longleat uh, House um, 21, manuscript Longleat House 21, where the superscriptio is complete. It is a Psalter and the entire Psalter is, is, um, uh, is translated into Latin. Some other manuscripts, such as this beautiful Psalter today in Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris 113, have, uh, have the, the uh, Hebraica version in the margins, and the superscriptio is uh, very sporadic. Only a few words are translated into Latin. So we are talking here about two completely different phenomena. The one where uh, the, uh, the superscriptio translation is just the annotation, the gloss of some words, of course, I think concerns the study of the Hebrew by specific people. It is not necessarily related to the superscriptio tra translation as an entire, complete, uh, fully fledged text. So, first of all, we need to differentiate as well between Hebrew manuscripts, which were written for Jewish readers as Hebrew manuscripts. That means they are constructed from right to left and contain the Hebrew text. The Latin part is a later addition. Later, meaning 13th century at the latest. However, this, this is an addition 
by Christian scholars once they got hold of these originally Jewish books. This, we have four books like that. Uh, one of them is Rashi on Prophets and Hagiographa from Corpus Christi College, Oxford, number six, and three Psalters, which were created for Jewish readers, but were appropriated by, uh, by Christian scholars who annotated them, sometimes with sporadic gloss, sometimes with the full superscriptio. This is the case of Longley House 21. That's the unique manuscript from this group, which contains a full superscriptio. And we are going to see that this is going to be our key manuscript in the discussion. And then we have bilingual manuscripts, manuscripts which were produced in Hebrew and Latin by Christian and Jewish scholars working in close collaboration with each other. Uh, we have here 10 different manuscripts, four Psalters, and other parts of the Bible. So you have later prophets, Pentateuch, um, uh, and some, uh, some of the uh, Ketuvim. So we have two different kinds of manuscripts which were uh, used, annotated by Christians, and used uh, for writing superscriptio. So here we are going to, um, to speak about the superscriptio, full superscriptio in manuscript Corpus Christi College 10, in manuscript Cambridge Trinity R86, and with a quite, quite a rich but not complete superscriptio in manuscript Corpus Christi College 11A, which is a Psalter. So these are going to be our, uh, our uh, documents on which we are going to study the superscript. As for the method, I'm talking a lot about the superscriptio, but what is the superscriptio? The method is actually very simple. The, the translator or the scribe copying a translate, translation writes specifically Latin words above the words of the Hebrew text in a very literal way, tipping very closely to the Hebrew original. Of course, it is quite problematic for the Latin, Latin readers because suddenly the Latin text is read from right to left like Hebrew. However, when you transcribe this superscriptio, you realize that it is a, a, a very fluent text. It is less elegant in Latin than the translations of St. Jerome, but it can be quite easily read as a flowing text. So it is not just uh, just uh, uh, punctual uh, sporadic glosses, but it is really a very well-structured text. So when we want to define the, the methods in a few words of followed by the translator of the superscriptio, we can first of all, um, uh, well, we are going to follow this example, which is Genesis 1, Genesis 1 4, 5. Uh, I'm using the text of the Vulgate in manuscript, bilingual manuscript, Corpus Christi College 5, and the superscriptio of the same verse in the same manuscript, Corpus Christi College 5. So I'm not using any edition of the Vulgate, I am using the Vulgate in the manuscript to make this comparison, but actually it's very, very close to the Parisian, uh, Parisian Vulgate um, text. But I'm using really the manuscript, the same manuscript for comparison. So first of all, we realize that Hebrew, the Hebrew text is followed literally and very closely on the, from the point of view of, of grammar, expressions, and, um, and semantics. So first of all, we realize, I have put it here in red, uh, that when Hebrew does not contain the, the, the verb to be, because as we know, in biblical Hebrew, it is not used in the present tense, whereas in Latin, we do have the verb to be, well, the superscriptio does not have the verb to be. Quod est bona becomes quod bona. Uh, when, the Latin, when, when the Hebrew text repeats the same word, we know that Semitic languages love repetitions and Latin doesn't. The Vulgate says a word once, whereas, whereas the superscriptio will repeat the same word each time when it appears in the, uh, in the Hebrew text. So, for instance, we have we have et we did deus in the Vulgate, and et we did deus, and, when di and then de we did deus, and then waka with deus, three times deus in three, in, in two verses, whereas it is only once in the Vulgate. 
because of course we have Elohim, we have the word Deus in the Bible. Then again, another word which is repeated twice, it's wokawit or apelawit kweth in the Vulgate, the word kara vaikra. So uh, it is repeated twice in the Hebrew text. We have et wokawit deus and wokawit noctem twice in superscriptio, but only once apelawit kweth in the Vulgate. So you see how closely Hebrew is followed. From the point of view of the grammar, in the Vulgate, the darkness is called tenebras, tenebras twice in accusative plural, whereas in superscriptio we have singular, tenebram, tenebram, because hoshech in Hebrew is in singular. And from the point of view of, uh, of, of the expressions, again, as you know, when in Hebrew you want to say that something is separate between something and something, uh, X and Y, we say bein uvein, which is, which is rendered perfectly in superscriptio as divisit Deus inter lucem et inter tenebram, and the God divided between the light and between the, uh, the, the darkness, whereas in Latin it would be, it's not very elegant, so we simply have divisit lucem ac tenebras. So we see how closely the text is followed. From the semantic point of view, as you can see, we have, for instance, the translation of the word kara, baikra, to call, apelawitque, and, and God named the, um, the light day, whereas in Hebrew, uh, in the superscriptio, the verb which is used is wokawit, which is closer to, to vox, the voice, and to the Hebrew word kara, which means to name, but also and especially to shout, to call, uh, or to read um, aloud. So as you can see, we have here a perfect correspondence between Hebrew and Latin. This correspondence is also attested at the level of specific parts of the uh, Hebrew text. Uh, as you know, sometimes uh, words which are separate in Latin or English are written well as a, written as separate words on the line are written together with the word in Hebrew, such as uh, such as definite article or preposition some prepositions or suffixes, possessive or object suffixes. So here, of course, the translator will have a little problem, but he will write very co correctly the the specific translation of the part of the Hebrew word above this part of the word. So. He knows very well Hebrew, and he knows how to adjust specific parts of Hebrew to the um, uh, uh, specific parts of the Latin translation to the Hebrew, specific Hebrew parts of the word. Here you have an example of the article, hamayim, maim aquarum, and then for the article, he has a problem because Latin does not contain an article, but he knows that it's a specific separate word the waters, literally, so he will not leave this word untranslated. He writes simply AR, the abbreviation for articulus, above the hay. So it's very important. He does not leave this, these parts of the Hebrew word untranslated. The word articulus is used not only for the definite article, but also for the particle at which, is, which introduces the direct object uh, in Hebrew, mm, uh, of course, it is, not, um, it is not translatable in Latin. So here, again, the word, of, the, the word article is used. And in some cases, it is also used for the preposition lamet, which normally means to or towards. Why are these different parts of speech used, used to, to, to uh, a called article, why are they defined, all of them, in the same way as article? This is because the Christians in 13th, 12th, 12th and 13th century England had this idea that uh, the, the prepositions and the definite article replace and are perfect equivalents of the Latin declension. We find it in Roger Bacon, but also uh, the earliest attestation of this attitude comes from Herbert of Bosham, a commentary to the Hebraica Psalter. Uh, since the Hebrews lack the oblique cases, 
they distinguish the cases only by the articles. With this procedure, the er error can easily arise. So this is why in the superscriptio, it is exactly the same Christian tradition of uh, considering the, the articles as declension. And this is why in the superscriptio, not only the definite article, but also the other parts uh, of speech, preposition lamet and et, the preposition of, uh, of direct object, are called AR or articles, articles. Now I would like to say a few words about the connection between different manuscripts with the superscriptio. So first of all, there is a group of manuscripts which contain, which were copied, biblical manuscripts, which were copied by the same scribes. The main Hebrew text and the main Latin Vulgate translation were copied by the same scribe. So there is a scribal connection between this manuscript. So this manuscript, so here you can see examples of how similar the, um, the, the Hebrew script and the Latin script are. I have given you examples of Bodleian, uh, of the manuscript Bodleian Oriental Hebrew uh, 62 and uh, Bodleian Oriental Hebrew 46. So one of them is um, the book of Chronicles and the other is the book of Ezekiel. They, are, they have as well very similar dimensions, similar proportions of the pages. They belong to a cycle of the Bible. I think that this was a, a set of the texts of the Bible, volumes of the Bible, which contained different parts of the Bible in separate volumes created by the same scribe. Uh, and some of these uh, manuscripts were also glossed by the same hand. I propose to call this hand the elder. I will maybe explain later why. It is a long story, but just to make it simpler, I identify a glossator who wrote the superscriptio, but also glosses in, in the pages, uh, in the margins of the pages. This person is an excellent Hebraist, he is anonymous. I don't know who this person is. I will call him the elder. It is a convention that we have between us for the time being. So I find the hand of the elder in Longlit House 21 in the Psalter, in Corpus Christi College 9 in Samuel and Chronicles, in the manuscript Oxford St. John's College 143, which uh, uh, contains jo Joshua, Judges, Song of Songs, and Kohelet in manuscript um, Bodleian Oriental 46, which contains other parts. Uh, no, which actually contains, no, 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 no. Which contains, sorry, which contains Chronicle and Ezra and Nehemiah, and the Bodleian Oriental 62, which contains Ezekiel. The same person annotated as well some passages in the Rashi commentary on prophets and hagiographa in manuscript Corpus Christi 6, and he was also the corrector, not the writer, but the corrector of the superscriptio translation in Corpus Christi College 10, the Psalter. I understand that it's a little bit confusing now, but what I try to convey is that the same person annotated these many different manuscripts. Some of these manuscripts were, for instance, manuscript Corpus Christi College 9, St. John's College 143, the two Bodleian manuscripts here, uh, were written as, as, as the same cycle of biblical volumes. The others were written as separate units, but we, they are linked by the hand of the glossator, which is a 13th century glossator. This glossator is very characteristic, not only from the point of view of his script, he also wrote in a Christian hand, he was a Christian, he also wrote some Hebrew words in his glosses, but he also uses, he's the only one to use a very idiosyncratic term, a neck, a neck, you have it in all of his manuscripts, which is a corrupted and abbreviated version of onkelos. He refers to the targum saying a neck. So he's very characteristic. He knows the targum, he knows Hebrew. He's a very good Hebraist. However, we know that he was helped by a Jewish scholar 
because he refers to the Hebreus Meus, as you can see here, in one of the glosses in manuscript Corpus Christi College 9. So here is a, a diagram which shows you the relationship between these different manuscripts, manuscripts with the superscriptio, manuscripts with the same glossator hand, the elder. What is important is that we are going to find the superscriptio, same version of the superscriptio in Longleat House 21, Psalter, Trinity Manuscript, Corpus Christi College 10, uh, Corpus Christi College 11. So we have four different examples of the superscriptio. So we have seen that some of these manuscripts are related by the, by the hand of the glossator. The manuscript Corpus Christi 11 also quotes the superscriptio, but in a very specific way. This manuscript is different from the others. It does contain the, the column of the Hebrew text, which was tailor-made for the Christian scholar who later annotated the manuscript. It contains the translation, the Vulgate translation. It contains as well a commentary, but also like the manuscripts of Correctoria, it contains collations with many different versions. Among these versions, we have R for Roman version of the translation of St. Jerome, but we have also what is called Judeus. So you have here in, uh, in green, the references to the Judeus. And when you read clearly what Judeus is, you realize that actually Judeus means, uh, means simply the superscriptio the text of the superscriptio. So this manuscript does not contain the superscriptio as a fluent text. It does have some words which were glossed, as you can see here. However, it contains quite systematically comparison with the superscriptio. Another, another um, source for the superscriptio that I'm not going to discuss in detail is the trilingual glossary which was edited by scholars in Paris and myself. We were eight people working on this uh, project. It was published in 2008. It is a, an amazing uh, dictionary which, of, of biblical Hebrew, which was created by Christian scholars in 13th century England, copied in the third quarter of the 13th century. It contains 3,682 uh, 3, Hebrew entries uh, divided between nouns and verbs and about 1,000 words were translated into Anglo-Norman, and four words were translated into Middle English. So one of the sources of this dictionary was the superscriptio, including the superscriptio references to Enek, to Onkelos, in this idiosyncratic form. But I'm not going to use today at all the, uh, the dictionary for the examples, because it leads us in a more complicated part of, uh, of the comparison. So in order to tell you a little bit more about how the superscriptio works, so superscriptio, as I said, we have actually four manuscripts with full superscriptio that already very Smalley has said that they are actually the same text. Of course, in the Middle Ages, none of the text is identical. Every single scribe introduces corrections, uh, differences, different opinions. However, we can follow these texts and see that actually they uh, represent the same uh, translation. The four examples concern the Psalter. We don't have other parts of the Bible with so many different versions. So in order to, to do it, so we have the Longleat House 21, the Trinity College Psalter, Corpus Christi College 10, Corpus Christi College 11. We have as well a few examples, five, five examples of translations of the superscriptio in the Latin preface of the manuscript Corpus Christi College um, 10. We have therefore five different versions and number six, it's going to be the, um, the dictionary. However, the dictionary, as I said, I'm not going to quote it today. So in order to... Um, to give you an example, I have chosen to show you the Psalm 18, which is 17 according to the Latin version, verses 2 and 3. You have here the King James Bible translation. 
And then I would like to show you what is happening with this particular text when the scholars work on it from the point of view of the superscriptio. So first of all, we will notice that the Hebrew version, the Hebrew text, the division of the verses is different from the Latin. The, the, the manuscript that I follow here is the manuscript Longleat House 21. This manuscript was written for Jewish, for Jewish readers. This is why the Hebrew text is identical in this case to the uh, Masoretic Textus Receptus. According to the Masoretic Textus Receptus, the, the word Vayomer at Dixit, and he said, is included into verse 2 of this psalm, whereas in the Vulgate translation, it is associated with the verse 1. The verse 2 in the Hebrew tradition is very, very, very long. It stops just here. It's a long verse. In Latin, it is cut in two. So actually, verse 2 in Hebrew corresponds to verse 2 and 3 of the Latin translation. In Longlit House 21, the Hebrew text was divided according to the Hebrew tradition of dividing the text. However, the glossator, who is the Christian, made some changes. So here you see that the sof pasuk of the Hebrew verse finishes includes Bayomer into verse 2. This is the division between the verse 1 and verse 2. However, the glossator added a line or two lines after Bayomer to say, this is where the Latin text stops. This is where the Latin verse 1 stops. Then he also added, so here we have the verse 2 and the long verse 3. He also added, in addition to the normal soft pasuk of the original scribe, he also added an additional soft pasuk at the level here, you have it in uh, this salmon orange, at the place where the Latin text divides the long verse 3. So we have here this different division, which was added later to this Hebrew text by this Christian scholar. We have as well what, yeah, okay. When we go to the other examples, other manuscripts I told you about, Corpus Christi College, uh, and then Corpus Christi, well, uh, sorry, uh, first, on your right, it's Trinity College, Salter, then on your left, Corpus Christi College 10, and at the bottom, Corpus Christi College 11. So here, the Hebrew text, was already copied following the corrections found in the text of Longleat House 21. So we have the di division of the text. Well, it is not respected for the verse between verse 1 and 2 in the sense that the word Vayomer is included in verse 2. However, the verse 3 is divided be before um, before Elohei Tsuri. We are going to see that it does not really correspond to the, uh, to the uh, Hebrew verse. In the manuscript Corpus Christi College 11, the glossator realized that there is a discrepancy between his manuscript, which was tailor-made for him, probably using one of these manuscripts as the model, and the Masoretic text. So he erased this separation in the middle of verse 3, which does not correspond to the Masoretic text. So it is slightly convoluted, but you can see how the tra tradition of di the division, which is signaled here in orange if in Longleat House 21, is followed in the other manuscripts, bilingual manuscripts this time, created for Christian readers. In the manuscript Longleat House 21, the Masoretic text was corrected by the glossator. The expression umefalti eli suri erse was changed, was transformed. Not only, as we said, sof pasuk was added, but also, as you can see here, the aleph of eli, my God, was erased 
was uh, was 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 considered as as a mistake, corrected, and the translation of what remains lamet yud li to me is 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 done on the corrected form. Mihi, those you you can see here the Latin translation mihi to me. So the superscriptio followed the corrected Hebrew text. However, someone else, another Hebraist was dissatisfied with that and added in the margin Elohei, which is actually a mistake for Eli. It should be Eli. Elohei, it's, a, it, it's, it, it's simply, it, it's a mistake, translated as Deus. So you see that it was first corrected to take the Aleph away and then retro-corrected to make Elohei, as Elohei. What we find in the other manuscripts, except for Corpus Christi College 10, which has Eli, we find the, the form Li here as well. So in all of them, we find the form Li, and then we, we find the form Elohei. Both Li and Elohei were again retro-corrected -co in manuscript Corpus Christi uh, College 11, which corrected it again with the Masoretic text. But what we see here is that very clearly the corrected Long Lit House 21 was used by here by the copies of the two other uh, manuscripts. This is the correction and the commentary by Corpus Christi College 11. Some books have Li, Mihi, which is to me, but the best ones don't have it. And he gets back to the Masoretic text as Eli by crossing away Li and crossing away the hay of the wrong Elo Hai. When we look, we don't have much time, but when we look just for one minute at the translations of these different manuscripts, we realize that Mihi appears in all of them and that all these translations are very, very close to Longlit House 21 and different from both Septuagint and Hebraica. So we can compare this different version. We realize that when the text, like here, for instance, we have the word ewazor every, everywhere in our text, rather than refugium or liberator and salvator in, uh, in the Jerome's translations, so when we go to Longlit House 21, we realize that very often there are two different translations that were offered in the superscriptio. Liberator, like in, in the Vulgate, it was crossed away and the word Ewasor was written as correct. So we have two versions, but one is considered as correct. And the one which is considered as correct is explained in a gloss in the in the margin, I translate it as the the glossator says, my escaper, not liberator, that is the one who makes me escape, as in Genesis 14, 13, that one who had escaped, Hapalit, that is, he was safe. So here the translation evasor is completely new when you compare it with the um, with the Vulgate, but it's not just a synonym. This is a synonym based on another occurrence of the same Hebrew root in the Bible. It is explained. It is used in a very conscious way. I will not have time now to give you more examples. However, I would like to point out that because of this very conscious use of the translation of these several different translations and the one that Longlit House 21 uses and comments, and also the fact that if there are different translations in the other um, uh, witnesses of the superscriptio, at least one of them is always attested in, uh, in uh, Longlit House, House 21. I think that after studying for many years the, 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 the superscriptio in these different manuscripts, I came to the conclusion that whereas Corpus Christi College 10 or Trinity Psalter or especially Corpus Christi College 11 are elaborate 
uh, versions which were tailor-made for Christian leaders, readers from a specific manuscript, the origin, the model, which really served for the translation was the manuscript Longleaf House 21. I think that that was the model which was used to create a series of other manuscripts, bilingual manuscripts with superscriptio, of which three are, are still preserved. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much you very for much, that. Very I'll wait a moment. Thank you for a fascinating presentation. We will be having uh, questions and discussion uh, after the third paper. Our third presentation this afternoon is by Robert Day Harris, who is professor of Bible at the Jewish Theological Seminary. He teaches courses in biblical literature and commentary, particularly medieval Jewish biblical exegesis, and he is chair of the Bible department. Dr. Harris has written several books and has published many studies in the history of medieval biblical exegesis in both American and Israeli journals. He also lectures on biblical narrative and Jewish liturgy in congregations and adult education institutes around the country. Dr. Harris has lectured as a visiting professor at universities in Europe, Canada, and Israel, and has served as a rabbi in several congregations in the US and Israel. Topic of his presentation this afternoon is speaking to and about the other terms for Christians and Christianity among 12th century rabbinic exegetes. Please welcome Dr. Harris. Shucks, thanks. Um, uh, in a seminal article published in 1899, Wilhelm Bacher raised the question whether the term minim as used in the Babylonian Talmud, might be a way for rabbinic sages to refer to Christians. More recently, scholars such as Michal Barasher and Peter Schaefer have sought to determine the degree to which we might understand passages in the Talmud and elsewhere in ancient rabbinic literature that reference minim as indicative of dialogue and other forms of cross-cultural exchange between rabbis and churchmen in late Roman antiquity. However one might answer those questions, there is no question that by the 12th century, the rabbinic exegetes regularly referred to Christians as minim, and as well as by other terms in their biblical commentaries. In my paper, I will survey a number of passages in which the rabbis reference exchanges with Christians in interpreting scripture, either by using the term minim, or notzrim, or other terms. In particular, I will seek to determine the valence with which they use the terms, whether in a disparaging, neutral, or even mirabile dictu positive tone. First, a bit of background. Uh, uh, Franz van Lira and I go way back, uh, along with, uh, with Dan to Kalamazoo days, um, and uh, I affectionately call him uh, Meus Christianus in our, uh, our, uh, our, our background uh, together. Um, uh, one of the things that Francis pointed out to, us, to me was the uh, apparent dichotomy in Christian references to Jews between Hebrew and Jude, right? Jude. In Francis's words, I'm quoting from an email, um, which is like medieval manuscripts, Judith, but without the corrections. Um, Hebraorum of the Hebrews is paired with words like tradition, books, ceremonies, codices, authority. Judeorum of the Jews is paired with words like lie, lies, wiles, tricks, perfidy, stubbornness, and so on. Clearly, he knew people in my congregations. Um, additionally, as I have learned, in certain Christian literature, Hebrew can refer to Jewish converts to Christianity. Therefore, I became curious to learn whether or not there was a concomitant Jewish dichotomy in descriptive language when referring to Christians. Um, uh, as Kohelet would say, Sof Tavar Hakol Nishma, which is uh, translated as spoiler alert, I did, not sign, I did not find such a dichotomy. But I must uh, note an important caveat. 
Uh, and this really gets to the, the, the detailed work that we just learned from, from Judith. You really need to go to the manuscripts. Um, to get a better grip on the material and to assess the various terms rabbis use to ref reference Christians and Christianity, we need to do much, I need to do much more serious manuscript work that I've not yet completed. On any question associated with Christian polemics, censorship, including both Jewish self-censorship as well as censorship uh, by the Christian ecclesiastical authorities, has played a great role, read havoc, uh, in our ability to precisely determine what the manuscript tradition can teach us. Sometimes one manuscript variant of a text will use the term minim, whereas another variant of ostensibly the same text might say notzrim, yet another might say ish echad, a certain man, right? Thus, any conclusions to which I might point at present are decidedly tentative. Moreover, let me say from the outset that one must be careful not to leap upon the presence of the word minim in medieval uh, uh, context as an indication that the exegete is speaking about contemporary Christians of whom he may know something or with whom he may have been in contact. Many such uses are more accurately described as medieval rabbinic citations of ancient rabbinic sources. And uh, the first example, I gave you one on your handout, which I think you have, correct? Good. Um, this is our, uh, Rashi on Genesis uh, 126. Let us make the human in our image. Rashi comments, and you see, um, uh, this is a citation from uh, a, a Midrash that he is channeling. Um, because of the plural, of course, Christians could point to the triune uh, mystery behind the nature of God, whereas uh, uh, a Jewish uh, rabbi would say it's just one God and have to justify that. That is an old Midrash, not contemporary with Rashi. Um, while the citation of what was already by Rashi's time a Midrash of several hundred years old may be a way of expressing Rashi's own awareness of contemporary Jewish Christian polemics, again, a question others have asked about the use of medium to indicate Christians in ancient rabbinic literature, it is no, by no means certain that he is. Therefore, the subsequent examples I will cite from the exegetical literature will either clearly express an awareness of contemporary Christians and or understanding of Christian theology and practice of which the exegete was personally uh, aware. As we know from a variety of sources, learned Christians would consult with learned Jews in order to refine their understanding of Hebraic Kaveritas that they had received via Jerome's Latin translation. One celebrated record of that is found in Rashbam's commentary on Exodus 2013, or in certain uh, traditions, verse 12. Lo tirzach, thou shalt not, what, <laughs> right? Is it thou shalt not kill or thou shalt not murder, right? So in Jerome's translation, Christians had long read non okidas, thou shalt not kill, uh, of the authorized King James Version, right? Rashbam interprets otherwise, and along the way reports his contacts about this with Christian contemporaries of his. Right? I'm not going to go through uh, detailed here. Um, uh, I'm not going to justify whether or not he's accurate in his commentary on the word. But towards the end, he says, I responded in this way against the heretics. Now, that's that word minim. Again, I think just what he means by this is Christians contemporary with him, and they admitted to me that I was right. Another one, now you can say Rashbam is uh, uh, tooting his own horn, but we have no way of verifying whether or not those Christians accepted or did not, uh, at least not to the, my present level of understanding. Even though in their Latin books, the same verb is used to translate the verb mot, as in the phrase um, uh, from Deuteronomy 32 and the verb ratzach in this verb, Exodus 20, their translations are inaccurate. Now, the question of whether or not Rashbam knew Latin or knew, knew it well enough to uh, study it on his own is not something I'm going to take up right here. And Sari Yefet, of course, wrote a great article about that. Um, my guess is possibly a little bit less than Sara said, but along with a friendly Christian at his side, Rashbam could understand it much the same way Andrew would understand Hebrew with Maes Hebraeus by his side. But that's to be uh, further uh, demonstrated in some other presentation. Now, in our context here, I'm not interested in explaining the process through which Rashbam or other exegetes interrogated scripture, 
again, or whether or not they were correct. I would just like to consider the context in which this discussion took place and how Rashbam referenced Christian when he wrote about them for Hebrew reading Jews afterwards. Here we see that Rashbam employs the Talmudic era term for heretics as a mean of referencing contemporary Christians. In that regard, he was quite typical, and there is nothing that is unusual. And what catches our attention, however, is what is he doing there in that context? How did he get there? Why was he in front of Christians? Elsewhere, he indicates that he's invited to speak before Jews or Christians in various locales. Um, we'd love to know more. We don't have a way of knowing uh, precisely what is going on. But he, uh, uh, one last point here, he seems absolutely unafraid to critique Jerome's translation and to offer what he considers to be the correct understanding. What is also remarkable is his claim that this group of Christians with whom he is in conversation accepted his translation in lieu of their own reception history. So the middle of the 12th century it's still safe for Jews to be brazen and bold, right? That'll change within about 50 or 75 years. It, it, there's a, a precipitous decline after that. Moreover, by Rashbaum's own testimony, we know that this particular example does not reflect a singular occurrence. On the contrary, Rashbaum regularly traveled to speak with Jews and Christians about the meaning of scripture, again, presumably by invitation. On another occasion, he, re he reports speaking with Christians about the prohibition against kilayim, diverse mixtures. In his commentary on nine, uh, Leviticus 19.19, 19, I don't think you have that here. Um, you shall observe my laws. You shall not let your cattle mate with a different kind, etc. He writes, an express, this is an explanation of what he's giving in conformance with um, derech eretz, now, Derek Eretz literally means the way of the land. And he, I think, is, is, is trying to um, channel the natural or the obvious meaning of words in their social context, right? It's, it's really unique to him in many ways. He has lots of drachim, ways, derche mikraot, derche orchim, the way of travelers. He wants to understand in a kind of almost Aristotelian sense, what does the universe say about such a, a phenomenon. So Derek Eretz is one of his ways, and concurrently with that, he says, by the way, Derek Eretz is tshuvat minim. It's a way of responding to Christians. And towards the end, he says, to the heretics, to the Christians, I said that the text outlawed clothing of two different colors, for wool is generally colored, but linen is not. They accepted this translation or this explanation. Now, it is not completely clear to me if this last sentence indicates that Rashbam had taught or would explain something different to Jews. That's an older Talmudic trope of, we said this to the Hever here in the Beit Midrash, and we said something else to the Gentiles out there. I don't know enough to know, to, yet to know whether or not he has uh, the same kind of orientation. I've made the claim elsewhere that while there's a great deal of scholarship indicating Christian acceptance of Jewish interpretation and the superior understanding of Hebrew that rabbinical scholars possessed, it would be all but impossible to find Jewish interpreters accepting a corresponding interpretation offered by Christian scholars. This is completely understandable given the great enmity most Christians, let alone the church as an institution, express towards Jews in Judaism. And that circumstance, as I indicated before, only grew more negative as the 12th century rolled into the 13th and beyond. What has gone largely unnoticed and what I've already written about is the whole-scale adoption of Christian hermeneutic and the technology of manuscript glossing by rabbis in the 12th century, 11th, 12th century. This is something new, the idea that there are commentaries on texts. This is something that the rabbinical scholars in northern France took whole scale from Jews. There's absolutely no evidence whatsoever in antiquity, right, that rabbis did this. It was almost entirely an oral culture. So please, if you ever hear somebody say, in the ancient commentaries of the Talmud, eh, cut them off right there. They don't exist, right? But in the 11th century, they start to exist, and it's not without its own controversy. Yet here and there, one finds exceptions, and Christians' influence on Jewish exegesis may be found, though usually disclosed between the lines, so to speak. One example of this may be found in Rashi's comment on Ezekiel 2.1. I put that on your handout because it is absolutely remarkable. 
Um, he gave an explanation, the details of which do not interest me right now, and then he recites afterwards. So did a Christian min explain this to Rabbi Solomon, and it pleased him. Now, this clearly is a gloss by one of Rashi's own disciples reporting what Rashi said. It's a phenomenon that we know a lot about in 13th century manuscripts that report dialogue in the 12th century or even earlier. And I just, I assume that it is correct. Rashi had this uh, encounter with a Christian who explained the text to him and he goes, you know what? That's a good one. I'm gonna put it in my commentary. Note that not only does the term min here not carry a negative valence, it actually points to a positive evaluation of the Christian's interpretation. But it must be admitted that a source like this is kind of an outlier. Despite the positive evaluation of the interpretation offered to Rashi by a Christian, most reference to Christians using the term min or minim are found in more negative polemical contexts. And Genesis 49.10 is one of the classic places where you'd find stuff like this. Uh, uh, the interpretation often figures in polemical context. The verse itself is somewhat enigmatic. I leave it to, uh, to you to read it. Uh, the, the words ad ki avo shilo are here rendered according to Jewish exegesis as so that tribute will come to him, thus separating the Hebrew morpheme shilo as shai lo, two separate words. However, as is well known, Christian exegesis takes Shiloh as a proper name, Shiloh, and seeing it in anticipation of Jesus. Rashbam is aware of this interpretation, but deflects it in his own inimitable style, taking the verse as a prophetic reference to the incident when the Judean king Rehovam came north, uh, but ended up offending the northern, Israelite, uh, northern Israelites and thus dividing the kingdom. Again, it's a long, uh, uh, a long explanation but just look about two-thirds way down. This, in, oh, maybe I gave you just part of it. I don't remember. This interpretation constitutes a refutation of the heretics. Shiloh, that is written here, is just the name of a city. For there are no vernacular words in the Bible, nor is Shiloh, his, written here as some Jews claim, nor Shaliach, a messenger, as the Christians say. Dot, dot, dot. Um, Note that Rashbam uses the term minim and notsrim interchangeably here as referencing Christians. One of the things that led me to believe that there's no dichotomy in rabbinic usage. Note also that his comment is effectively, uh, again, polemical both against Christians and prior Jewish interpretation. And while we have seen on other occasions that he mentions that he shared the interpretation with Christians, here by all indications, he only speaks about Christians to other Jews. On several occasions, Rashbam will explain a religious observance that Christians either rejected or disparaged, such as Jewish dietary laws, and defend it as a superior practice. We find um, a, a bold example uh, in his commentary on uh, Leviticus 11, which is found in the chapter containing most of the Israelite laws concerning food taboos. Following his explanation, Rashbam concludes Again, following the plain meaning of scripture, here it's not uh, the term he used before, but simply pshuto shal mikra, census literalis for you Latin speakers, um, as a response to the heretics, all domesticated animals uh, and etc. cetera are, are repulsive, right? And because they damage and heat up the body, whatever that might mean, and that's why they are called impure. Expert physicians also say so. There's a, a kind of a, a reference to science will agree with me. And so does the Talmud conclude, Gentiles who eat disgusting things and insects, their bodies are damaged or heated up. Note that in the, la at the end of this example, Rashbam is citing what the Talmud had said about Gentiles in its contemporary world, although it seems fair to conclude that Rashbam felt similarly about the dietary habits of contemporary Christians as the beginning of his commentary indicates. I'm gonna jump to uh, uh, the end of the 12th to the beginning of the 13th century because it's only really by that period where you have a clear example of a rabbi who really knows uh, Christian literature and theology and that's Rabbi David Kimchi or Radak. Uh, think not Northern France, more Provence in the South. Um, uh, he knows more about authentic Christianity than rather through hearsay or talking to people about it. Um, uh, he, he really thinks uh, beyond the exegetical. He's really thinking of a kind of um, a, 
a deep structured appreciation of what Christianity is, how it differs, and how it might even be similar to Judaism. Uh, given that all the dozens of references in the exegetical literature that I considered, Radak easily referenced Christianity and Christians more than all the other exegetes combined. I, I read through, for this, dozens and dozens and dozens of references like this from a lot of literature. Radak alone, on his side of the scale, outweighs everybody else. So we were really in the presence of somebody who's concerned about this for the various reasons. This is mostly due to the time in which he lived, when relations between Jews and Christians had already seriously begun to deteriorate, but it is also a sign of his interest in learning about Christianity to defend Jews in Judaism who were vulnerable to Christian ecclesiastical and uh, political power. Let's consider an example. I have a couple from Psalms here. Torah uh, the Torah of the Lord is perfect, right? Um, now, he writes that this is um, a reference to the entire Torah. For him, when, when a rabbi uses the term Torah, he, like this, he means the, the 24 books of the Hebrew Bible, what's called the written Torah. We would call that the Bible, right? But he's using it as a term as opposed to Torah Sheba'al Ped, oral Torah, meaning what becomes the Talmud and the Midrash, etc., rabbinical writings. And this is not according to the words of the heretic Christians. Now I want to point out, he calls them ha-kofrim, ha Kofer is a really tough word, right? That really means heretical, right? Um, a kofer, uh, uh, you know, it makes his appearance in the Passover Haggadah that we're about to read. He's the wicked son. Whether or not that's a stand-in for Christians is a separate but interesting issue. Um, I think not, by the way, but that's just, me. that's just me. But at any rate, he says, the Torah was commanded at Mount Sinai, which was in effect only until the coming of Jesus. Note that he, he doesn't have any hesitation like you know, many yeshiva you know, boys today would not say the word Jesus, oy va voy, right? That other one, right? He, for Radak, he's simply trying to analyze a problem, and he does so that because up until his time, the Torah was of the body, right? And that's, I think, my, forgive my uh, Latin tr uh, pronunciation, corporeliator, right? And since he uh, came to, uh, God commanded us to understand only of the spirit, spiritualiter. I mean, he knows his Christianity, I think, pretty well. Of course, then he doesn't, this is not National Brotherhood Week. He goes on to say, their words are nothingness, chaos, and vanity, right? This is not, um, right, we don't say this in ecclesiastical uh, collections today. Um, uh, he knows the difference between derech mashal, allegory. Now, we do have some 12th century rabbinic exegetes, namely Bukhor Shor, who transliterate the term mashal into Hebrew letters as allegoria, right? Which itself shows you that uh, when they're talking about figurative language, some of the rabbinic scholars understand what Christian allegory is all about. And then you see he critiques it, right? He, he does not want you to think that the uh, commandments are allegorical. He understands that is precisely how the Christian church wants you to understand them. We see that Radak clearly understands some of the basic tenets of Christianity and moreover knows the Latin terms for this as well that he clearly references and translates. Now, in an excerpt from a type of polemical excursus to his commentary on Psalm 110, not only does Radak attempt to refute a central tenet of Christianity, he does so by critiquing the Latin translation of Jerome, whom he calls by name. Now, if you can picture in the, the manuscript tradition, he goes line by line through Psalm 110, explaining it as he would according to its shot, according to its plain meaning. And then he's got a, a long discursus on the end, or ex excursus, which is kind of a mini polemical treatise, which I, I think, I, I don't know if, how much of it I've given you on the handout, but it's there. But he says the Christians explain this psalm about Jesus, right? And they understand that because of a problem in their Latin text. The way that Jerome, who he calls um, Gerul Maish, I think he's trying to, trying to render Hieronymus, right? Um, he, he understands that they understand a kametz under a certain letter of Hebrew vowel as opposed to a chirik, which the Masoretic texts have. This means effectively, is it Lord, capital L-O-R-D, reference stand in for Adonai, the divine name? Or is it Lord, I mean, maybe a capital L, but definitely lowercase O-R-D, a reference to the king? 
That's a huge difference, as you can well imagine. In the midst of all the persecution that Jews experienced by Christian hands, Radak nonetheless found it possible to distinguish between Christians who were kind and those who were cruel, and to rely on this both to make an exegetical insight and, I would argue, virtually function as a halachist, a legal decisor. And that's our next um, uh, uh, example. Psalm 15.5 praises a righteous person in the following language, one who has never lent money at interest or accepted a bribe against the innocent. The man who asks thus shall never be shaken. Now, a variety of factors in the Middle Ages led Christians to force Jews into the virtually sole occupation of money lending. And this is a well-known chapter that causes and details of which we will not uh, discuss here. But the question for the exegetes on both sides of the Jewish-Christian divide had to contend with the Bible's somewhat contradictory messages on the subject of lending money. Let us examine an excerpt of Radak's commentary on the verse. Now, it's, again, it's, it's long. I don't recall. I apologize. That well, well, Actually, one second. I can tell you. You have all of it, it's a long one, good. So um, uh, I'm not gonna read the whole thing because you you have it there. But he says um, towards, the, uh, towards the middle to the end, I'm, I'm gonna just uh, uh, pick up here in the middle. The preceding considerations do not apply to the relationship between a Jew and a Gentile because a Jew is not required by Torah law to act with selflessness and to offer the Gentile an interest-free loan, for in any case, the vast majority of Gentiles hate Jews. This is true. It even possibly remains to be true, except in our glorious country, uh, that really one of the only places in the history of the world where Jews and Christians seem to be part of the same body politic. Baruch Hashem, I would say, right? Praise God. I hope it always stays that way. The question is, in the Torah, the Torah makes a distinction between lending money to Jews and lending money to non-Jews. So that seems to Radak, as to most rabbis, to be the effective law, right? The clear, plain reading of this psalm would indicate that David, the putative author of the psalm, would not make such a distinction and would condemn all money lending at interest, right? And the Christian church at least officially takes up that position as its ideal. So we have loggerheads in how to read the biblical tradition. But certainly then he goes on to say, if the Gentile acts with goodness and kindness towards Jews, the Jew is also ab obligated to act towards him with kindness and to do good towards him, meaning to lend money without interest. I have gone on at great length in this commentary so that you will know how to respond to the Christians. Don't forget, he's writing for Jews. He's not writing for Christians. When they say that David in the psalm did not make a distinction between Jews and Gentiles, but outlawed all interest. However, it is not possible that David would prohibit that which Moses, our rabbi, permitted. You see, you can't have that kind of internal contradiction. The rabbis will always resolve it in the favor of the Torah, and that will be determinate for Jewish law. Everything else is good advice, right? However accurate one may consider his interpretation, it is in any case remarkable that Radak states unequivocally, but certainly if the Gentile acts with goodness and kindness towards Jews, the Jew is also obligated to act towards him in the same way. And he does so even as he expresses aware of, awareness of the charged atmosphere around the subject of money lending. Now, um, <clears throat> you know what? I'm going to stop here. This, this is, we've gone along. This is good. Um, the, the idea here is um, if the exegete is, is engaged with purely interpreting a scripture, that exegete might go in a certain direction uh, until the end, like all the way, right? Think Rashbam if you want to. Uh, but when you, when you start to have um, circumstances, life, interfering with the interpretation of scripture, at that point the exegete starts has, has to go, how am I going to deal with this biblical text in the way that the people who hold that text dear, right, have to live their lives? The problem, of course, for subsequent Jewish-Christian relations is they think about it differently. Tadaroah, thank you very much. Are we here? Yeah. Okay. It's time for discussion. We have about half an hour. Uh, if you're attending uh, remotely on Zoom and would like to submit a question, please do so through the chat. 
uh, and I'll be keeping track of that and we'll uh, read the questions if there are any. I enjoyed hers too. Um, it sounds like last time Google Pixie spent a lot of time citing sustainability and tech impact. While at the same time thinking about sustainability as an app that they could write for their event. And I was wondering if they felt like that was if they considered that in any way that's probably problematic thing to do, or if they spent any time justifying why that was okay. I, I think not. Right. I don't. I, 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 there's no evidence to answer that question. By the way, you can hear me. I don't hear this as amplified. Did they hear me? No, then I just is it on. This might not be on. So just those are going to it's not unusual to be loved by it. Yeah, it's working. It's working. Okay. I'll be here all week. No. Um, uh, what I said before, if. Uh, uh, your, your question was heard, presumably, that um, I don't think there's any evidence for it, right? I think the kind of reflection that you're indicating, if we trust Jacob Katz, doesn't happen until the 13th century, the Meiri, um, who really kind of says, you know what? The Christians are worshiping the same God that we are, right? That means they're not ovde avodah zara. They're not idolaters anymore. They're, then there are profound legal uh, implications to that. I don't see it with Rashbam so much, and yet, they, you know, they live their lives among Christians. There's a great story about Rashi, um, actually about Passover, um, that one of his Christian neighbors, uh, a woman, uh, knows that Rashi's favorite dish is some dish of eggs fried together with nuts and honey. I don't know if that's such a delicious thing, but Rashi apparently liked it. And she, thinking that the holiday was seven days long, because that's what it is in the Bible, she brings him on the eighth day of Pesach this dish. He's upstairs in his room, and they tell him, you know, your neighbor is here with this dish that you love. And he's caught in a bind because he likes her, he appreciates the gift, but it's still Passover, so he can't eat. He says, tell her I'm very busy and to leave in the courtyard, but say thank you very much, basically. Right? So they, they live their lives with Christians, but I don't know that they had that kind of abstract thinking about it uh, that your question poses. We already have a couple of questions on the chat, so I'll uh, introduce those. The first one, um, did the early Christians translating the Hebrew Bible have anything similar to a Christian Talmud? Uh, no, I would say that there's a rough analogy, if it's pointed to me, there's a rough analogy between the patristic literature and the Talmud and Midrash, but the methodologies are all different and the goals are different. Um, but they function in nascent Christianity and early rabbinic Judaism um, along similar lines. They ex express the church or the sages as the auctoritas, standing in for God, and getting to interpret scripture for their respective communities. Um, if I can, can I add something? Well, I did not really understand this question very well. Uh, does the question con con concern early? What does it mean early? Is it medieval? If you talk about the Christian Talmud, you must, you must refer to the translation which was created in France in 1245-47 the the extractiones of the Talmud. This is the Christian Talmud. So, are you talking about the Jews? Is the question cons does the question concern the Jews from the same period? That means 13th century. What are the early Jews? So, uh, I didn't really understand that. Judith, I I assumed that they, the questioner was asking about you know the second, third, and fourth century. You're talking about modernity, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, but what is, in this case, what is the Christian Talmud? The way I responded was sort of the, the patristic literature is sort of roughly analogous. Yeah, that's the way I interpreted the question, but it, it's not specified. So the, so the person who asked the question is calling what the Christian Talmud? I couldn't understand that. 
Well, the, the person asking the question didn't specify, but I understood it as Professor Harris did, you referred to, is there anything analogous to the Talmud, uh, to the, the fifth century uh, Talmud, let's say, in Christian literature? And as a specialist in early Christian literature, I would say, no, I mean, there's not a single body of uh, literature e that compiles all the different traditions and interpretations. There is patristic literature, which is quite vast. Uh, there are conciliar uh, you know, documents, creeds, uh, canons of councils, but there's no single collection in the sense of a, of a Talmud. Um, I, I just, as long as uh, Judith and I are speaking, hi, Judith, wherever you are. Um, uh, I, I was hoping to actually get to, to chit chat with you here, so I'll follow this up with an email because one of my doctoral students was writing on the Ramsey text in Corpus Christi, and she had all these questions that she wanted me to ask you. So my email will email your email. Excellent. Okay. Good. I I have a, a quick question for for Judith. Um, in one of the the texts you were. Uh, that you showed, it was a passage from the, I believe, the elder, who, referring to, uh, I, I think it was Hebraeus Maeus, or although it could have been yeah. Judaeus Maeus. Sometimes in Latin, when the Maeus or Noster is used, it's affectionate. Yeah. And so I was just yes. wondering if there's any sense that you had when, just as uh, Robert referred to I like that man his Christianos <laughs> Maeus. Yes. Is there is yes. there any chance yes. that yeah. well we don't have any notion about this specific Hebraeus, so I don't know about this specific Hebraeus, but for sure I have spent my life trying to show how Jews and Christians work together sometimes on the same books. So they were physically present and working together. So we can, you know, from the intellectual point of view or, or, or polemics and so on and so forth, we have this image of segregation. But when we, when we actually look at the material culture, that means manuscripts and how they are made, we get on the contrary, the, the impression of people working together. I think it might have changed by 1240 in Northern Europe, but, um, but clearly in the first half of the you know, the beginning of the 13th century and clearly 12th century, the Jews and Christians lived together and uh, they formed friendships, maybe. We don't have much evidence about that, but we have clearly contact, daily contact and work together. So I do believe that when he says Hebraeus meus, he doesn't necessarily, necessarily mean uh, that he owns him, but on the contrary, that someone that he knows well and he works with. And uh, yes, and I think that uh, that uh, links very, very well with uh, uh, with um, with David's um, um, paper and the uh, and the question the question about um, about the the Christians and the Jews who knew each other, the interpretation of the other, and the Jews or Christians accepting the interpretation of the other. So we expect, of course, that that when when, uh, when the Vulgate is mentioned, the Jews would not as, uh, uh, accept it, or on the contrary, that the, Jew, that the Christians would not criticize the Vulgate in the 12th or 13th century. That was not the case. When you have a look at the manuscripts, or for instance, the dictionary I have mentioned, Trilingual Dictionary, it's written by Christians. They would say, this is how we trans this word, Hebrew word, this is how we translate it, and this is how the, the Jews translate it, and they usually quote Rashi or another interpretation, and then they would add, et bene, and this is correct. So what the Jews say is correct, not the Vulgate. So, you know, normally you think, well, in the Middle Ages, you criticize the, the Vulgate, you are heretic, should be burned. Well, it was not always the case. There, were this, th there was this exchange, intellectual exchange, where people understood the ideas of the others. So I think that uh, that uh, looking at the, the sources, we get this uh, this like this Hebraeus meus, uh, a very close relationship and uh, quite different from what we normally think about the about the relations as they are described in uh, historical sources. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a question over here. 
Um, thank you. This is a question for uh, Professor Ozlovsky Schlanger. Um, and I, I wonder if you could say something about the reception of this scholarship after the mid 13th century. Is there, is there, is there any evidence? Is there good evidence? What, uh, what uh, does it have a, a nachlach, as you would say in German? Yeah. Thank you. That's our problem. So we are trying to show how important Hebrew studies were in the 12th and 13th century. And uh, at the end, we don't know whether we are talking about a bunch of eccentric people or whether it was something much more structured and important. However, there is a follow-up. So, um, so uh, soon there is going to be a publication about, uh, about Robert and Thomas Wakefield, uh, edited by James Carley and Charles Burnett, where you are going to see that these medieval um, 13th century scholars, actually, the books circulated up to the third, uh, 16th century in England. And we know as well that, uh, that medieval 13th century English scholars, 13th century, inspired Adam of Easton, who was an English cardinal by the end of the 14th century. So we don't have lots of evidence of this, of this continuity, but there was a continuity. So now a big question is whether people like uh, Nicholas of Lyra knew this 13th century English Hebraists. I'm not sure, so he lived in Normandy. There is no reason why he shouldn't, but this is still, the, this is still to be studied. These connections are still to be studied. So I know perfectly well from studying the manuscripts that there was some follow-up. I cannot uh, say yet who exactly knew this uh, tradition. There is as well another, another thing to, to be studied. It's the connection between 12th century and, for instance, the work of um, uh, commentators such as uh, Herbert of Bosham and the school of, of English Hebrews in the 13th century. And the school of English, English Hebrews in the 13th century in itself, it's not one moment in time, because we know that the most uh, ancient manuscripts date from the let's say 20s or 30s of the 13th century. This is the Long Lit House 21 gloss and the work of the elder. And then we have the dictionary that was based on it, which was written in the third quarter of the 13th century. So we know already that it is, it is a work which lasted several, several years. It's not just one one uh, group of people in one point of time, but it is across the 13th century, and the roots are clearly in the 12th century, because we have three manus bilingual manuscripts from the 13th cen uh, 12th century. So we know that it's something that continued. We can follow it during more than 100 years already. So it's not just one eccentric person, but there is uh, some continuity. And in the 16th century, these books were studied. We have glosses of Robert Wake, uh, Wakefield, the first Tudor professor in England, on 13th century Hebraist works. Thank you. We have uh, two questions of those present, and then there's also one on the chat. So I saw um, Franz, and then. Um, Thank you. Sorry to make you walk so far, Camille. Um, again, my, my question is also for, uh, for Judith. Um, I, I loved your paper uh, very much. And um, w one question, well, uh, about the, the, the last thing that you said, I would love to discuss also a dis the, the link that I see between 12th century Paris Hebraists uh, mm -hmm. in their the incipient phrase, uh, phase of mm -hmm. Um, Christian Hebraism, I would say, um, and the English 13th century. Um, I, I see a lot of manuscripts by Andrew of St. Victor's, mid 12th century, that are um, 13th century English in places like, mm -hmm. for instance, Bury St. Edmunds, uh, which is not too mm -hmm. far from, from Ramsey Abbey. Um, yeah. But we'll, we'll talk about that later. My, my question really is about uh, textual criticism of the Latin Vulgate. I was especially interested in the, the Genesis 1 verse 4, where um, I forget which one is which, but the, the, the Vulgate says tenebram, and I think the Hebrew says tenebras. 
Um, no, the contrary. Uh, just the opposite. Okay, I'm, I'm mixing them up. But um, I know that there are variant readings of the Vulgate. Um, do the Superscriptio authors have any um, idea about different Vulgate readings? Do they, just like the Paris Coratoria, say, well, Ali E and then other manuscripts have this reading and compare that to the Hebrew and say, therefore, this variant in the Vulgate is more conformed to the mm -hmm. Hebrew? Yes, so I think that all this story of the of the Hebraism and the translating of the Bible is related to the activities of Correctoria. It's another facet of the same story. So the problem with the bilingual Bibles is that for the book of Genesis, we have only one bilingual, bilingual Genesis. So I cannot talk about the Vulgate, but I can talk about the Psalter. And when you look at the Corpus Christi College, and this is why also I didn't want to enter into the problem of the textual variants, because, and this is why I have quoted the version of the Vulgate from the manuscript itself, rather than from an edition or, you know, or other, other things. But uh, so I just wanted to quote from what the Christian scholar had in front of him at that very moment. But anyway, your question is very important. I think that, uh, I think that uh, that this collation of the Bible, uh, which goes back, of course, of the legend of the hexapla that they didn't have in the Middle Ages, but the legend was there, and different patristic sources were talking about, you know, the Bibles in different columns to compare them and so on and so forth. So I think that it goes that correctoria and these bilingual Bibles are actually are, are used for the similar uh, similar purpose. And as far as the Psalter is concerned. When you look, look at Corpus Christi College 11 that I have quoted, it does give different readings. It is a correctorium. So, you know, Hebreus, which is the superscriptio that he calls Judeus in this particular manuscript, because some other manuscripts call it Hebreus and some call it Judeus. It's interchangeable, but it means the superscriptio. So it is just one of the versions of the Psalter that he gives but he gives other versions. So he's comparing with other, I think, manuscripts or um, I, 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 I could identify, of course, the Hebraica that he's quoting in full, Gallicana and Romana of uh, St. Jerome, but I think that he's collating with other versions which are different manuscripts. So I think that the question is, yes, they were very much aware. And I think that they were using Hebrew as one of the versions. And then they decided that that's the best of the versions. If I can throw in here, my doctoral student, Lorraine Enlow, has, I think, demonstrated, made a pretty persuasive argument that at least one of the manuscripts that Judith mentioned, um, that the uh, superscriptio is using Rashi to correct the Latin and create a new translation. That's, yeah. This is exactly what the superscriptio does in all of these manuscripts, and uh, especially in Longleat House 21. Rashi is the main source, not the only, yes. but Rashi is yes. quoted in this entire corpus. We have, uh, we have several hundred references to Rashi. So we, we have done it when we worked on the edition of the Longleat House 21 dictionary. So we spoke about all the patri all the Jewish sources, including Rashi. Superscriptio is based very often on Rashi, but it also quotes Solomon ibn Parchon, and in more than two hundred cases, it quotes um, the Targum. It refers as well to the Talmud, but I think the Talmud is either via Rashi or via um, uh, Liber Gamaliel. And in Corpus Christi College 11, it quotes Maimonides as well twice. So there is, you know, Jewish sources. The Rashi is just the basic. There are much more interesting and unusual sources that this Hebraist, the elder, knew. So I call him the elder, and the others copied from him. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We, the last question was from the present Corcoran chair. There was a question from the future. Thank you so much um, for three very interesting papers. I have a couple of questions. <clears throat> One um, for Judith also. Um, 
I'm wondering if you were able in your work to look kind of systematically at verses that are central to Jewish Christian debate and polemic, right? So you, you happen to have a Psalter. Um, you, you talked about examples where the author says the Jews say, and we say, they recognize the differences. Well, I'm imagining, you know, something um, as central as the second Psalm, um, you know, where, where, you know, Rashi there, um, this is interesting for Robert also, that, you know, this is one of the cases where Rashi refers to the reading of, rejecting the reading of the Minim, and he goes so far as to reject the traditional reading of the rabbis in order to refute. In one manuscript, it says, Talmidei Yeshu. <laughs> yeah, the exactly. students of Jesus. Yeah. So, so yeah. I'm wondering if um, you see these types of places. Yes. You know, do you see, um, you know, the, the elder willing to veer from the traditional reading of the Vulgate, even in such cases, or no? Um, and then a second question. Yes. Very, and I'll just ask my second question very briefly. Is for Robert. It's a question that's very simple. I think it has either a very simple answer or a very complicated answer, depending on how you think about it. Um, in your title. You refer to um, terms for Christians and Christianity um, in these writings. I see many examples of terms for Christians. I'm wondering if you find terms for Christianity. A term for Christianity? Is that we, I couldn't hear the last part. Of yes, that. yes. Uh, terms, terms for Christians and Christianity among 12th century rabbinic exegetes. I, it's the, <laughs> the simple answer is there's no nuts root, if that's what you're asking about. But when he talks about, let's say, Radak on uh, uh, of the body or of the soul, those kinds of distinctions, he's not talking about Christians per se. He's talking about Christianity. But we could talk later. Yeah. So thank you very much for this very important question. I didn't have time to give you my second example that I have prepared, but the second example was uh, relevant to what you have said. So all these uh, elder group of people, I would say, and 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 the glosses and so on and so forth, have one very important attitude. This attitude is philological. They are perfectly aware of the problems and the different interpretations. Sometimes they try to avoid it completely. So they pick up the Jewish interpretation, and sometimes they simply don't quote the Christian interpretation at all. So here I will talk, I will give you two examples. One is from the elder and the annotations, and the first one is actually from the, from the dictionary Longleat House, which was based on the elder. So when you look the, at the dictionary, for instance, you take the word Alma, which in Isaiah is interpreted as the virgin, which is uh, interpreted in Christian tradition as, as, as Virgin Mary and as the prophecy of Virgin Mary. So what a Christian scholar writing a dictionary should do, he should illustrate the entry Alma with the quotation from Isaiah and to say that it can mean virgin. So what is done in the dictionary, Isaiah is not quoted at all. And as the proof text in the dictionary to illustrate the word, they will go to Shir Hashirim, that's Deborah's talk today, Shir Hashirim and to, to Song of Songs and use the word Alma in the sense of young girl. And they would say Alma means, it's the feminine of Elem and it means a young girl. And they don't quote at all the Christological interpretation, which is amazing when you think about 13th century Christian scholar. And they are Christians, there is no doubt about it. These are even not converts, these are monks and they call themselves Galachim, the tonsurate ones. This is how Christians are referred to uh, normally, uh, if, if it is not a polemical text, the Christians are referred to as Galachim, as the, you know, the Christian monks, as uh, tonsurate people. So that's one example. The other one that I wanted to show you today, and I didn't have really time, is the, um, uh, is, is, um, is, uh, wait, I will, maybe I will, I will look at it, uh, to make it quickly. So I wanted to show you an example which is from the Psalm 22, which is Psalm 2117, which is this very important psalm, for many dogs have encompassed me, the council of the malignant have besieged me, they have dug my hands and my feet, right? So very important Christological image in the, in the uh, Psalm 22, where there is the, the Hebrew, 
is reading Ka'ari, which means like a lion, whereas the Christian translation see it as the verb karu, that means tederund, as for the sorry, foderund, as in uh, in the Vulgate, that means to make holes in something, right? Like Jesus's uh, uh, Jesus's crucifixion. So this is a very important important uh, uh, psalm. So in the elders' work and the other superscriptio translation, they will translation they will translate it quasi leo as a lion. That means exactly like the Hebrew text. So they go away from the Christian interpretation. However, the marginal gloss, the elder will say, actually we think that it is karu. That means they made a hole in his hands like Jesus, but Hebrew does not have it. So Hebrew translates sikut leo, right? So they are perfectly aware, but they try not to enter the polemics. They are pure philologists in the, fifth, in the 13th century. It's very interesting. It's unique. We couldn't believe in it when we started to read this text properly because, you know, they were known. People signaled this text. But when you start really to read them and edit word by word, you get an image that you didn't expect. And this is what is happening. This is how I knew that they were not from a center like Oxford or Paris, but they must be from a place which is totally eccentric because they are basically heretics. <laughs> uh, thank you. We have just a minute or so. There's been a question in, on the chat for about 20 minutes. So let's take that and then we'll have one more. Um, the, the chat question is, my question is for Professor Harris. Marty Lakshin has suggested that the Rashbam may have been in direct dialogue with Christians in France. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Absolutely. He says as much. Uh, Marty and I see eye to eye on that point at least. <laughs> we disagree about other things, but I won't go into that right now. Okay. And then time for one more. Was it? Yeah. Uh, sure. This is also a question for Robbie. Um, you, you use a lot of, um, sorry, I'm going to ask this question. Uh, how do you differentiate between what is citational, in other words, referencing earlier meaning material, and what is reporting, and what is a reuse of early meaning, meaning material to say something about contemporary Christian polemics? So with respect to Rashi in the 11th century, because he lives most of, his, most of his life in the 11th century, um, most of what he channels is older material. Um, roughly speaking, it's like the Glossa Ordinaria looking at patristic literature, about 75%. So if you see it in Rashi, like the one example I gave you, almost certainly he's, he's looking at old material. The question is, how does he reflect about that, about contemporary, and it's, it's nuanced. You know, uh, Devorah does the same thing in her book. It, you, gotta, you have to sort of use your gut because there's not a clear example with that. When you have a Rashbam, I'll pause for a second. My teacher, Ed Greenstein, always says three trees make a row. If you have three, trees, three examples or more of a certain phenomenon, you can see a trend. So the fact that Rashbam says on a number of occasions, this is what I said to the Christians and they admitted to me I was right, I think that's a phenomenon. So I, I generally think that, um, uh, like the questioner that was waiting there, uh, that uh, Lakshan and I s agree, he's in contact with Christians. Um, and he's, he's situated at just the right time in, you know, there's a little more integration, there's a little more dialogue, and, you know, the, the pogroms, at least in France, haven't started, right? <laughs> that kind of thing. So um, by the mid 13th century, of course, it's much, it's much worse. So Rashbam has a, a relatively calm a way of talking about his dialogue with Christians. Um, there are certain anonymous commentators or tosophistic commentators later, and it's, it's more highly charged. All right. Well, this brings us to the, the end of our time. So thank you, David, for convening us and for our three presenters. So let's offer them a round. Uh.